My name is Lindsay Romasanta and I serve as Chief of Staff to the Division of Student Affairs. Our next session is a very ambitious one. We have five talented panelists who are here to speak about topics that you all have been discussing at fruition. So conversations around faculty mentoring and how is it that we diversify um, both professional school students, including medical school, and then also ways of knowing um, related to faculty. So I'm pleased to introduce our panelists, uh, Dr. Marielle Vasquez, Dr. Zoila Mendoza, Dr. Jesus Velasquez, Dr. Alicia Rusoja, and Dr. Mark Henderson. So please help me welcome them and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh -huh. Is this one on? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you, Avanza, for allowing us to give highlights from the Office of Academic Diversity and the School of Medicine. I will be passing slides. So this is a schedule for this session. And we will start with the highlights from Campus and CAMSA. I am the Campus Faculty Director. My name is Mariel Vasquez, and I'm also a Professor of Mathematics and of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics here at UC Davis. And um, our center receives funding mainly from the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and other uh, few sources. The Office of Academic Diversity is one of three units in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion that is led by Vice Chancellor Renera Toll. The Office has three, the Office of Academic Diversity has three main components. Uh, Avanza with Director Lina Mendez, who you all know by now, and uh, two centers, campus and campsa, you will hear from us in this session. So just a few more details. We have a really, really incredible team at the helm of the Office of Academic Diversity is a professor, is the Associate Vice Chancellor of Academic Diversity, Professor uh, Luis Carvajal Carmona, who was rec very recently appointed sitting over there, uh, Lina Mendez, who you all know, who, um, who leads the Avanza Initiative, a Hispanic Serving Institution Initiative, myself, Professor Zoila Mendoza, who is sitting right next to me, and a set of really, really wonderful support staff, Tom O'Donnell, who is sitting somewhere over there, uh, Rosa De Dennis, uh, who has been helping a lot today outside and inside, every, and uh, Sophie and Barbara, who essentially um, are the support for campus. They're funded through academic diversity and through a grant from the Sloan Foundation. And I'll tell you more about that. Uh, campus was born out of the UC Davis Advanced Program that was funded between 2012 and 2018 by the National Science Foundation. And our goal is to change the face of science by, and here I'm borrowing from Professor Cuellar, by redefining excellence. So thank you for that wonderful talk. Uh, there are 39 faculty. Uh, in, they represent 31 different STEM disciplines across seven colleges and schools. And next year it will be eight colleges and schools because we're welcoming someone from the School of Nursing. I don't need to explain the excellence on the screen to you. We have two thirds Latinx faculty, three fourths women, and these are the role models that the students want to see in front of the classroom. Um, they all joined the center as new faculty, most of them assistant professors. As you heard from the deans, the provost office provides generous incentives to the hiring deans for, uh, to support the campus faculty scholars. Once a year, campus reviews nominations. They go through a very rigorous selection process to select the new cohort of faculty who represent the research excellence and the integration of diversity, equity, inclusion in their research, their teaching, their service. So um, they are fantastic mentors, fantastic teachers. They collaborate with community members. They do field work. You name it. Here, STEM should have two M's. We have quite a few faculty from the School of Medicine. 
And as members of an R01 university, they are all, of course, exceptional researchers. And as we heard before, one narrow measure of research productivity is shown by their success in, seek in seeking and securing external funding. For lab scientists, that is fundamental. They cannot do their work, and that includes mentoring of the students without external funding. Our faculty have been very successful, and this is just a glimpse to that. Um, we just received new data yesterday, so actually the number is uh, here at the top, should be updated to more than $46 million in the cohorts from 2014 to 2022. The main funding agencies are, of course, the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation, but funding comes from all over the place, including state, foundations, etc. I just wanted to put this up because I know there's people here from all over the UC and UCOP. Our academic diversity office has very, been very involved in uh, in looking for funding from the, from the Advancing Faculty Diversity Program at UCOP, and have, since 2019, we have secured four grants. And, uh, well, they are very active, but I, I won't be talking about that uh, today. In campus, we have several initiatives. I will focus on two of them, again, because our time is quite limited. I will tell you about, UC, uh, about Campus Enhance and Campus Advance. I'm happy to answer questions about the other two. Um, the reality of this excellence in STEM research is tied to the faculty's ability to secure external funding. Whether we like it or not, that is a reality. And junior faculty don't typically come to campus knowing how to write these grants beyond having written fellowship applications in their graduate years and in their postdoctoral years. If we're lucky, they wrote a K01 award or a K99 award, but most faculty don't really have the extensive grant writing experience that they need to succeed in an R01 university. So the other component is and it's another hurdle based by a faculty is the work-life balance. The demands of raising a young family, of caring for a disabled relative, and or caring for elder parents is incompatible with the productivity expectations in our one university. So we put together this grant, Enhanced, that was funded by the Sloan Foundation and received support from the campus, from all the deans and the provost to have two very pointed initiatives, faculty support and research development support for our faculty. And uh, since 2021, when the grant started, we have provided 18 family support grants and the demand is increasing. We're changing the culture. Faculty are realizing that, yes, they are entitled to this help. Our culture tells them, no, you're not entitled to family support. Yes, you are. And we're changing that way of thinking. And um, we have provided specialized research development assistance on 37 grant proposals and offered four grant writing workshops. The next one is going to be in Green Gulch Farm at Muir Beach in June. And uh, lastly, and I know I have no more time, so I'll just leave this up because I want you to join us. We oversee the advanced program. We offer two awards to senior faculty at UC Davis who, um, who represent this integration of diversity with excellence in research, teaching, mentoring, and service. One of our advanced awardees is now our Associate Vice Chancellor of Academic Diversity, Luis Carvajal Carmona. And uh, here are three of them. They're going to give fantastic talks. It's a free event on a Saturday. Please come, please send your students, please send poster presentations. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Soyla Mendoza, and I'm the interim director for CAMSA. CAMSA is kind of like a mouthful um, kind of like name, and most people say, what is it? So um, you just heard a wonderful overview um, of, this, of these programs from Ariel, and CAMSA is, is much newer. Uh, it, 
inaugurated its first cohort of scholars in, in 2019, and then the pandemic came, so <laughs> there were some hurdles there. Um, again, I'm, I'm new since last September, but I am here to tell you of some of the accomplishments and what's going on right now um, with, uh, with the program. Um, here's um, our total of 21 scholars that we have admitted, we call them, you know, the, the group, the cohort of people that we admit as named as scholars, because we do have another membership um, level that I'm gonna talk to you about. But these are the scholars that come in that are selected through a very rigorous process as the come and the CAMSA scholars. And again, CAMSA is mouthful, but you know, because it has the social sciences, arts, and humanities. So it's a very diverse group, but it's, you know, 21 scholars at the moment from four colleges and 11 different departments. So this, um, Last year, uh, one of our members of this last year's cohort is going to be talking to you about our, her own research, and you can obviously see the excellence in our groups. So, um, um, so like um, again, Kamsa being in New York, and it started uh, seeking for funding uh, later, and it received for the 2022 20, uh, period. Um, a particular grant from the University of the President called PLACE, that gave support for creating mostly communities that are we were concentrated on writing. As you may know, in the social sciences and humanities and some arts, writing and publishing is crucial for obtaining tenure and advancing. Um, and so our communities have concentrated so far in giving that kind of support so our scholars can thrive and we can retain them and they can make it through the system. So um, through this uh, PLACE um, grant from the University of the President, um, uh, the previous director was able to create these communities and, and create this um, you know, advancement for those who benefited from that. Now that uh, grant also uh, had some funding for um, other uh, projects, and I will refer to at the end of the presentation uh, how that has led to fruition re very recently. Okay, so this is our current uh, writing um, community, the members. We have uh, Veronica Lerma, who is from the, and I'm just doing this by memory, not, not by any order. <laughs> Veronica is from our most recent cohort in the Department of Sociology. And um, she is currently working on a book project that she's going to present to presses and finish in writing, dealing with um, incarcerated Latina and Chicana uh, women. And then we have Kathleen Whiteley, who is one of my colleagues. I'm also the chair of Native American Studies. Uh, Kathleen is a Wiyot enroll California Indian, and she's working on a book related to the, the claims uh, of her um, tribe against um, the United States um, federal government, California state government. Then we have um, Darnell, I always have a problem with pronouncing Darnell Degant, who is uh, from our first uh, cohort and who is from the School of Education. Um, again, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned, Veronica is from the Department of Sociology, Kathleen from Native American Studies, and Darnell is from the School of Education. And he is working on a book, and he's very getting very close to tenure and the pressure, and he's really trying to finish this book. and. Um, is uh, writing a book on you know black youth and the media um, stereotypes, um, very simply put. And then uh, Ariana Valle, Valle, who is also from sociology, another uh, uh, Latina member of our uh, center, and uh, she is from Puerto Rico, and she's working on how Puerto Ricans are changing the political landscape of Florida. So um, very interesting projects. They have this writing community where they get the support of a writing coach. They have individual as well as group dynamics through two quarters, and they share their, and they write together. And so they're right in the middle of it. And as far as I hear, everything is going real well with that. And I said I was going to go back to 
this um, one of the elements linked to that place grant um, that we had, and unfortunately it's, it's over now, but we're gonna be seeking for more funding for more of these kind of programs. Um, CAMSA, uh, as well as Campos, have a big group, a bigger group of affiliates. That means scholars throughout you know, the different uh, departments and colleges that are part of the community that we're trying to bring together to be part of this community to support and to mentor our, um, you know, the newer cohorts. So um, Jessica, who is also a member of my, my department, Jessica Bissette Perea, who is the Nina, Alaska native, just uh, maybe we got to have two weeks ago got uh, the news that her book received this amazing award from the American Musicological Society. Now, if anybody has any idea of what these kind of societies, which are Western art, white oriented kind of, you know, um, uh, in type of institutions, um, you would be able to tell how, you know, she is changing the field. She is training musicology. She brings in her, you know, Alaska Native, the Nina identity and perspective. And we are all about perspective, right? We are into multicultural perspectives. Well, that's in the title of our centers, both for campus and CAMSA. So, you know, I, I copied what uh, actually was given as a reason why this book um, really was awarded this this big award in this field because she really is changing, you know, the whole landscape in the study of American music. So again, she's one of our affiliates and she was the recipient of a particular grant that supported her to advance this book. So I know my, my time is up and you're gonna hear very interesting also presentations by some of our scholars. Thank you so much for the opportunity. All right, well, first and foremost, it's an absolute honor and I'm extremely excited to be here today uh, to share with you uh, just a grand opportunity that I've had uh, for the past couple of years. I joined UC Davis in 2016 and I was greeted with the Campus Faculty Scholars Program. And immediately when I, I remember going to the first meeting of the Campus Faculty Scholars Program, the first thing that the, the sort of take home message that I got was, we want to encourage you to be yourself. We want you to encourage to speak up. If you think that you need to use your personality and an identity to teach, to mentor, you need to do exactly that. And that to me was just game changing, to experiencing that from the get go, right? Because before that, I was thinking about the four hours as well, right? I was thinking about, the, okay, so when I get there, we're gonna publish, we're gonna get the money, we're gonna do all this stuff, right? But then Campos basically said, listen, yes, but it's okay for you to be yourself. We want you to be yourself, and, and you'll see that uh, you'll have a lot of opportunities to create impact. What I'm showing you uh, in this screen is basically the representation of why I feel that I have the great fortune of leading students in this uh, uh, research endeavor, specifically dedicated to developing chemicals for renewable energy and decontamination of water. So just the topics, because they're so uh, near and dear and impactful for folks, uh, it's, it, it, the topics itself are just magnetic for students, right? They just really want to be involved and impactful research, in research that actually means something. So Campos basically said, listen, be yourself. Here's this community that is gonna provide you the resources and uh, the support for you uh, to just really go after it. And that yielded, and for instance, uh, 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 resources and support for graduate students that became mentors of undergraduate students uh, and then it's just a nice, beautiful sort of uh, uh, domino effect after that when you have the peer mentorship 
uh, it, it, it produces the environment to get the scientific impact and results that you need to get those four R's and get the national attention that we've had the great fortune of getting uh, through funding uh, of different uh, support uh, at the national and international level. Now, uh, the picture in the middle with that sort of nice little cool logo is the picture of my group. Uh, we finally got the opportunity to take a cool picture because the other pictures were just photoshopped because of COVID, but anyway. Uh, and these students come from everywhere, from Puerto Rico to Dubai, from Argentina uh, uh, to, you know, the south side of the U.S. And they all come with, with all this enthusiasm to put in the science, but also when they see the ecosystem that we were able to develop for them, they feel safe, they feel secure, uh, and they really want to put you know, all this enthusiasm into action. Now, on the top uh, uh, right and left, there's two programs that I've had the opportunity to put together again, thanks to this sort of encouragement and, and nurturing environment uh, that Campos has provided. So uh, on the right, it, it, it's, uh, the the, it's a program funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, and what it does is it provides undergraduate students to come uh, to UC Davis every summer and experience research for 10 weeks. Now, we are being intentional in the students that we're recruiting, right? So we have, we have beautiful, we, we, we understand that just in the California state, we have Cal states, we have community colleges, uh, that we could uh, obviously reach out, go onto their campus, give talks about the science that is so magnetic to students in the first place, and then encourage them to apply and come to UC Davis uh, for the summer. Now, it, this goes back to that whole connection between peer-to-peer -peer, uh, mentorship relationship that I was uh, hinting you about, that it's just happening uh, through the support that we have when graduate students mentor undergraduates. The one story that I have is I remember uh, we received some campo resources to have a graduate student uh, to become a mentor over the summer, thanks uh, to this program that I lead from the National Science Foundation. That student mentor a student from the University of Puerto Rico uh, who had an amazing summer, amazing breakthroughs. And unfortunately, after uh, that, that summer, Hurricane Maria hit the island and it was, the support of uh, myself, the graduate students, the inherent sort of persistence of the student, we were able to still, uh, you know, support the student throughout that year, and a student ended up becoming a graduate student here at, uh, at UC Davis, and now uh, earned a PhD and is, is graduating, you know? Uh, it, it, but it, it only took that sort of daring to nurture that community of being yourself. Uh, and it sounds very simple, but it's just so impactful. And our students really need that reaffirming, that reassuring energy uh, from their leaders. Um, then the next program, uh, it's, it, it's, it's called, we call it Chem 98. And uh, essentially what it is, it's a, it's a co-class that we've designed understanding that general chemistry is like, you know, a monstro of the room, right? Right, general chemistry has been known to be that gatekeeping course, where students come in there, they take it, they fail maybe midterm number one, and all of a sudden, they don't see themselves as scientists or being in the STEM field, right? So I experienced it, I'm pretty sure we all kind of did experience it as well, so we, that, that, what did we do? We didn't reinvent the wheel. We basically said, let's support them. Let's put a coke class that is going to uh, address some of, the, uh, uh, it, uh, some of the deficiencies that they have with the actual course. But simultaneously, let's support mental health. Let's inspire them by showing them leaders that look like them throughout the quarter. Okay? And we do this in synchrony with all the other sort of additional resources uh, that the, the Department of Chemistry provides a students. And, uh, and I tell you, the, the, it's just magic happens. Now, again, we are intentional 
on, on how we are populating these cold classes. We obviously invite the entire community of the UC Davis population to come and participate, but uh, I knew me, myself coming, uh, being a product of pipeline programs, uh, one of the first things that I did when I joined UC Davis is I said, I wanna connect with EOP and I wanna connect with the Monero Scholars Program. And this is what we've been do doing. We've been using the support of EOP to identify the first generation low-income students that arrive here, even through transfers, or they are just first year straight from high school, and then uh, having that co-class as, as that additional support layer uh, to hopefully, you know, just remove from their brains that uh, they don't have the potential or the tools to actually succeed in general chemistry and become the next engineers and the next scientists. So again, uh, I, you saw the slide uh, in terms of all the amazing faculty scholars uh, that Campos has been able to put support over the years. I, just so priv I feel so privileged and honored that I get to share just a little bit uh, that we've been able to put together uh, thanks to the support of Campos, so thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, okay. So hi everybody. Um, I'm gonna read a little bit because I get very nervous talking in front of everybody. So my name is Alicia Rusoja. My pronouns are ella, she, her. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Education um, here at UC Davis and I'm a CAMSA scholar. I'm really, really um, honored and privileged to be a CAMSA scholar. This is my first year at UC Davis, so actually it's, I've not com yet completed my first year. And I do community-based research alongside fellow Latinx immigrants, so I'm a Latina immigrant. And this means that I don't research my community from the outside, but I, that we do research together. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my work. So my scholarship lies at the intersection of Latinx, Chicanx studies and immigrant rights organizing, critical pedagogy and critical literacy, and critical qualitative research. I'm particularly interested in doing that work in the context of university community research practice partnerships. And the motto, nothing about us without us, which actually is the fuller one, is nothing about us without us is for us, what reflects my approach to knowledge production? This is a model that was created by the disability rights movement. And it's used in the immigrant rights movement where I first learned about it, reflects the importance of approaching all of our work intersectionally, which Professor Cuellar highlighted in her work, um, and to do it in ways that center the knowledges, the power and leadership of those directly and most impacted by any research policy or practice. I first heard this lemma of nothing about us without us while volunteering at Juntos, a grassroots immigrant-led organization in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and the organization where I organized as a light-skinned, U.S. citizenship-holding, cisgender, middle-class Latina immigrant alongside undocumented and multiply minoritized Latinx immigrants between 2014 to 2016. Central to Juntos' work is the belief that no policy should be drafted or enacted without full participation of those most affected by such policies. As an activist and researcher, I am drawn to this motto for its implications for our academic work. And I think this is this nothing about us without us is for us, very relevant for today's HSI showcase. So related to, to our powerful work today, um, here's a question that I had as I was working on, on my presentation. What does it look like for our UCD Latinx Chicanx students to be seen already, to be seen as already holding epistemic privilege on how to impactfully serve them without, with all of their heterogeneous identities, including their gender orientation, their sexual orientation, their full bodies, their neurodiversity, their age, 
their socioeconomic status, their immigration status, their racialized identities, their family history, their family structures, their religions, their languages, and all of their other identities. So this really challenging that monolithic idea that also Professor Cuellar mentioned. So in my work, So in my work, I employ participatory and critical community-based qualitative research methodologies to understand the immigrant rights organizing and related literacy and pedagogies of Latinx immigrant youth, adult, families, and communities. Broadly, my interdisciplinary research illuminates the fundamental role of communal education and grassroots research in the intersectional political mobilization of immigrant communities. I'll now tell you a little bit about one of my research projects, a, a year-long qualitative practitioner research study with Juntos between 2015 and 2016. That's the organization where I learned nothing about us without us. So across that year, I inquired into my own and my shared organizing practice as an immigrant rights organizer, which I conceptualize as an educational practice. My data analysis was grounded on Chicana, Latina, feminist epistemology, and it included multiple rounds of open-ended interviews with an intergenerational group of 11 undocumented and documented Latinx immigrants. Photographs, videos, field notes, analytical memos, and member checks, which involved analyzing data with community members. It was, you know, their data. It was their lives. I found through this work that Latinx immigrants at Juntos organized intergenerationally through what I define as a communal pedagogy of resistance. And I want to tell you about a communal pedagogy of resistance um, because it's really important that we conceptualize, that we understand that our communities, our Latinx communities, are actually already educators and educational leaders. So this is a pedagogy that's intergenerational, that takes place in the homes, in the community organizations, and on the streets, and that grows from the facultad, this is Alessandua's work, or from the oppositional critical consciousness and epistemic privilege of oppressed people at the liminal space, that in-between space of the borderlands. It's a pedagogy that views our community's cultural, linguistic, and literacy practices as strengths and resistance tools. It expands our definition of family and our sense of interdependence to fellow oppressed communities. And it facilitates learning from each other's differing experiences of oppression across generations beyond familial relationships, teaching us to affirm and enact inclusive justice. In a nutshell, I argue that a communal pedagogy of resistance is the central tool through which Latinx immigrants organize for their and each other's and others' human rights. A key implication of this research is the need to challenge pervasive deficit views of Latinx immigrants particularly those who are low income and undocumented, for example, as uneducated, uneducated and as uninvolved in their own, their children's, and or their community's education. Instead, my research shows that Latinx immigrants on a daily basis teach each other and learn from each other and from fellow racialized and minoritized peoples in ways that reflect their complex educational expertise. This is an expertise that we should value, we have to value, we have to learn from, we have to learn about, and we have to follow. I'm currently adapting this work into a book for K through 16 educators that offers insights and implications for policy, practice, and research. Another direction of my work involves a five year participatory action research study that's now in its third year on the impact of COVID-19 on Latinx immigrants community organizing and educational experiences in South Philadelphia. And moving forward, I plan on continuing to build long-term community-led research projects alongside Latinx immigrants rooted in the slow building of trust. Since 2016, I have been volunteering at Causa Justa, Just Cause, a black and brown organization in the Bay Area. And I'm beginning to learn about and support the work of NorCal Resist, an immigrant rights grassroots organization in the Sacramento area as well. 
Relatedly, I have two nascent lines of inquiry that are here, located here in Northern California. The first one will explore intergenerational coalition building between Latinx, and, um, Latinx immigrant youth and fellow marginalized, racialized communities, including black, indigenous, and other peoples of color. And I wanna show, I'm sure many of you can see on the, uh, over there, it says, Las Vidas Negras Importan, Black Lives Matter, and Mi Lucha Es Tu Lucha, Mi Lucha Es Tu Lucha, Tu Lucha Es Mi Lucha, My Struggle Is Your Struggle, Your Struggle Is My Struggle. So I'm really interested in that intergenerational coalition. And then the second one will inquire into how research can respond to and resist colonial logics, particularly in the context of community engagement and community research aspects of university, school, community partnerships involving Chicanx, Latinx communities. So you see this image in the middle, it says research justice, methodologies for social change, and I'm really committed to engaging this concept of research justice, of actually carrying out research justice in ways that are fully driven by the epistemic privilege, the power, and the educational experiences and expertise of Latinx and Chicanx students here at UC Davis. I'm in the early stages, um, and also of their families and communities as well. I'm in the early stages of envisioning an interdisciplinary research justice center co-led or led by our undergraduate and graduate Latinx and Chicanx studies. And lastly, I'd like to tell you a little bit about one of my service contributions so far at UC Davis. I'm currently working with Professor Janela Blanco, faculty in the School of Education, and Michael Singh, faculty in the Chicana Chicano Studies Department, on creating strong and permanent links between our School of Education and our Chicana Chicano Studies Department. And we're beginning to plan an annual Chicanx Latinx Scholars in Education Speaker and Mentorship Series. Thank you for listening and I look forward to many years of working together. Thanks. Thanks, I'm gonna walk down here so I don't hurt my neck some more. I want to be with, with you all to do my slides. I'm Mark Henderson from the School of uh, Medicine and um, I'm so impressed with my my uh, colegas estimadas aquí. It's impressive work and um, I want to tell you about some things we've done at the School of Medicine under the rubric of what I would say is changing the workforce in healthcare in order to make or to achieve health justice for California, and there's, that's a long way to go to get there, but um, who we educate as physicians makes a huge difference uh, towards that end. Um, so again, I've been in part of a team that's worked, uh, that's done this work for about 17 years. Um, this is why we do the work. This is the uh, some pie charts of the who lives in California. You can see the middle pie chart is, is California, it's a you know, majority minority state, incredible diversity, uh, which you all are aware of. Um, unfortunately, to the right, the pie chart on the right are the physicians in California. And you can see that they don't reflect who lives in California. So in, in, in almost any way, um, you can see in particular, you know, the percentage of Latino physicians uh, is about 6% in California. And, and as you all know, over 40% of our, uh, our, the people who live here are Latino or Hispanic. Um, on the left-hand side of the slide is our school. So I think that this has been a long time coming and there's a lot of things that go into this, but our school more, you know, better represents California. And I think that that is our hypothesis is that makes a, it will and makes a huge difference in terms of closing health disparities in our, neediest communities. Um, the way we've done that is, is a long story, so I can't tell all of, the, all of it, but I wanna talk about a couple important parts, and I think several of my colleagues here have alluded to some of this, which is once you accept students into your ecosystem, you have to make it, you have to make, you have to welcome them, not only that, but you have to make the experience one that lifts them up and not knocks them down and, and get, keeps them connected to why they're there. And so what we've done at UC Davis School of Medicine is we've developed community health scholar pathways which are basically tracks within our school 
each one is dedicated to a particularly a particular marginalized or underserved community in California. You can see they're listed up here. There's seven of them. There are six to eight students in each of these tracks each year. And because those cohorts have an identity and a lot of peer support, faculty support, scholarship support, they are able to, I think, one, have an experience of medical school which is quite different from their colleagues, for I'll say traditional colleagues. Um, that is, we're able to focus on curriculum that is relevant to the communities I've listed here. You can see our first program was, uh, was one that aims to serve Northern California frontier and rural uh, uh, citizens of California, uh, residents of California. The second one is urban underserved or inner city uh, focus. The third is on the Central Valley agricultural community. The fourth is a three-year program instead of four, so it's a faster program to primary care medicine, which is one of the greatest health care needs, as you all know, in California. And then the last one, the fifth there, uh, focuses on Native American tribal communities. This is one that was funded by UCOP two years ago, and which we're beginning to, I mean, we're just at the opening sort of stages of that program. Finally, we, <clears throat> we've developed a number of partnerships with community colleges throughout Northern California to make the entrance into both to transfer to UC Davis and then to enter UC Davis School of Medicine much, much easier and much more supported along the way. And there are lots of places where <clears throat> that path has, has bumps in it and, and where people fall away. So I think focusing, you all know community colleges are, are I mean, they're like the United States of America, right? They really, they, they look like California. Whereas universities, lots of them, medical schools, lots of them, don't really reflect our communities. Um, this is just a bit of data. You know, I started this work in 2006. Um, our team came together and we've done lots of different things. This is the percentage of our students who are from underrepresented in medicine <coughs> communities. And um, in the last couple of years, uh, like California, our school is really a, is a majority minority school. And that changes a lot of things about the educational environment. Uh, it changes a lot of conversations in classroom, changes a lot of conversations in the hospital, and I think it, it ultimately changes the way healthcare is delivered in a way that it needs to be, needs to be more like. Um, lots of lots of things went into this. I think the main thing, and we've I think my colleagues have touched on this, is you have to you have to think about excellence differently, and you can't be using the usual I think things that we often use uh, that, that are, are often really barriers to a more inclusive workforce that we really need uh, at least in healthcare. I mean, in everywhere, but particularly in healthcare. Um, this is my last slide, which compares. Uh, UC Davis School of Medicine to the United States, all of the other schools of medicine. Uh, you can see that in the middle there, for instance, um, only six and a half percent of medical students in the United States are Latino or Hispanic. <clears throat> Here at UC Davis is 35 percent. Again, that, that's, you know, and uh, all the other groups I mean, it's a similar gaps that, that again, we need, to, we need to close. There's just tremendous under-representation under of uh, communities that, again, we, there's lots of evidence in healthcare that physicians from these communities are more likely to serve those communities in the future, but also to serve under, just underrepresented, underserved, marginalized communities in general. Uh, people who are on public assistance, people who don't have health insurance, immigrant communities, non-native English speakers. There's just so much evidence that we need a different workforce. So we're, you know, we're very proud of this work. Lots of effort goes into it. It takes money. It takes resources. It takes it takes a lot of really a multi-pronged approach. But um, we have a a center for a diverse healthcare workforce, which is funded by the Department of Health and Human Services, a federally funded program where we bring together people in our community, in the, in the medical community tr that, are, that are passionate and committed to, to this kind of work, uh, which takes, you know, it takes a very long view. And you really have to, and all of you know this, focus on um, 
what's upstream of often where we're sitting and looking. So thanks for the opportunity, Lena. Okay. Okay. Let's give them a round of applause for the awesome gems and insights and for miraculously staying on time. So we actually have opportunities for questions and answers. So do we have any questions from the audience? This is on. Oh, yep. we can hear you. sorry. Um, hi, my name is Vanessa, and I am a PhD candidate uh, in history. And my question is for Dr. Rusoha. Um, so I'm really excited. I was really excited to hear um, about your about your research and your work with the Chicano Studies Department. And thinking about the K-16 continuum, right, um, I am very excited about the, the 2025 mandate for ethnic studies graduation requirement in K-12 education, and then also the CSU requirement for ethnic studies, right? At the same time, we're also seeing a decrease in K-12 educators. And, um, and at the same time, same time, right? We have the Chicano Studies Department teaching these massive classes of 500 students. And we heard earlier today that, because we, we were asking questions about faculty, increasing faculty recruitment, faculty retention, and then they said, we heard, well, we don't have the lines of tenure. Well, if we have professors teaching these 500 student classes, we have an increase of students coming in, especially in 2025 with the graduation requirement to, to take ethnic studies. They're going to be exposed to the world of ethnic studies. We're going to have, and we need to increase the K-12 educator pipeline. So we're going to have to be educating these to be teachers in ethnic studies, but we don't have the faculty lines of tenure. As a current professor working both in education and alongside Chicanx, Latinx Studies Department, how are you coping with this as we're working to attain Hispanic-serving institution when we're not, so we're not able to serve? How can we truly, effectively teach 500 students in one class? Like, that's not pedagogically effective, right? Like, if we're looking at pedagogy, andragogy, and true, the idea of servingness, how are you doing it right now? And how can we make it better, right? And I'm just a graduate student, so. <laughs> You're not just a graduate student, right? That's, it's good. Um, well, I'll, I'll actually, I'll clarify two things. So I am, my hire, so as I understand it, because I've only been here for some months, is that my position in Professor Janela Blanco, who I mentioned, um, her position were part of a, a position, like it was a national search for faculty that were at that intersection of education and Chicanx Latinx studies. But we're both actually, like our, you know, our tenure process and everything is, is housed only in the School of Education. Um, we do work with um, the Chicanx and Latinx Studies, or Chicana Chicano Studies Department is, is the name here. And Michael Singh is, is a, the other faculty member that was hired as part of that, um, that search. Um, and so I'll defer to my powerful and like you were, you know, just completely incredibly powerful Chicana Chicano Studies Department faculty colleagues because they are the ones doing that work. So I teach introduction to schools and those classes are 80 students each section and I taught two of those this quarter, but I don't teach 500 person courses, and I do know my colleague Michael Singh and other powerful uh, colleagues in Chicana Chicano Studies do. And I think what you're highlighting is what I think multiple people across today 
across various roles and locations today have highlighted, which is that there's really no, um, I don't wanna use the word excuse, but I think it is that. I mean, we do need to be changing structurally Right, the institution. The, it, it, like you said, we have the we have that need. We have the students. We have that those requirements. We want to do that work. We need to have faculty who can be supported in doing that work, in a, in a way that's actually equitable and just. And it is unequitable and unjust to have very few Chicana Chicano faculty teaching those courses. So I think you're just highlighting a structural issue, which needs to be addressed, right? It's not about getting the numbers, like Professor Cuellar said, it's not just about having the number of Chicanx Latinx students, it's about actually serving them and seeing them as the powerful, knowledgeable people they are. So you're just highlighting what I think it's pretty clear from today. Hello, my name is Melissa Moreno and I'm a community leader and I so appreciate all of your efforts. Thank you so much for your hearts, your mind, your energies into all of these really meaningful and social justice projects. My question is, how do you respond to folks who, uh, well, let me back up. With the whole equity uh, movement, for ethnic studies departments, including Chicano studies departments, the question comes up of what have ethnic studies programs and departments in UCs actually gained from the equity movement? And how do you respond to folks who say, well, we're trying to get everybody, like ethnic studies is already doing equity, so we're gonna focus on other programs, departments, folks who haven't been doing it, but yet, as you know, our, our uh, colleague here in history, right, is pointing out, I mean, UC doesn't have an ethnic studies requirement. CSU does, community college does, high school does. That's area H dialogue right now. And it looks like it's at the top tier with the regents and BOG where we really have the issue for supporting institutionally a requirement for ethnic studies at the UC. So just sort of how do you respond to, again, folks who say we're, we're giving support, equity support to others outside of ethnic studies because they haven't done that work. Ethnic studies has always done that work. They don't really need that support like others do. How do you respond to that? Um, again, I'll defer to my, uh, they're here, I think, still, my Chicano and Chicano uh, faculty colleagues. They have epistemic privilege, right? Uh, they've been doing this work, and I think, I mean, as a new person to UC Davis, I would say that their response is pretty clear, right? They do need the support, um, and it's not an either or, right? It's not, it's, it's this, um, this uh, way of thinking that's about having less, what is the word I'm thinking in Spanish, but like, Scarcity model, yes. It's not like we need to be fighting and saying, oh, we need to give it to other departments, right? We're interdisciplinary scholars, and even if we're in different disciplines, it's a shared project, and we must be starting with and funding, no matter what, always consistently, structurally, Chicana, Chicano uh, studies, ethnic studies, which is, ethnic studies is much, be, much more than Chicana, Chicano studies, but today we're talking about HSIs. Um, so yeah, that support needs to be there, but again, I'm not the expert um, my Chicano Chicano studies faculty are um, the ones holding epistemic privilege here, so I think that's a powerful question to ask them as well. I think I want to say just a, a couple of things because your questions right to the point of something that I've been seeing because I've been a part of the EI and also as a chair of one of the programs. We don't like to use the ethnic studies rubric, but one of the programs that um, are with Chicano studies, Asian American studies. Unfortunately, it has to do with resources, and those, uh, the lack of resources uh, promote a disconnect between DEI and the programs, uh, Chicano Studies and the American Studies. Um, our you know, Vice Chancellor has tried to make an effort but to, to join, but uh, people in Chicano, Chicano Studies, you know, the chair and all, they really are not part of the DEI type of efforts. Because I think not because of lack of desire, but because of 
lack of resources. So, you know, if there were more resources, there could be a lot more programs to engage the faculty in all these programs and DEI, but they're not. And that is being frustrating. Again, in the short time that I've been in CAMSA, I have seen that problem. Again, it all comes to, okay, why do we have all these DEIs if it's really not going to work? If, is it just a rubric? Is it just for show? You know, so we really need to go deeply into the structure of how this is working. So unfortunately, we're at time. I'm going to bring up Dr. Mendez. Go for it. On the mic, please. Several people commented on this panel and then previous panels about lack of resources. There are 100 new professor positions coming. So, so the, the, the saying of, of we don't have resources, there's something so absolutely incorrect about that. So there's a disconnect with, with the deans, um, the schools, and, and executive management if you're talking no resources and they're talking 100 new professor positions. So that's not a question, it's just a comment. Um, so so the, the, the question I do have is how did, the, how, did the, the, um, how did the medical school come out so creatively with things like a three-year uh, MD program for primary care? The law school has come out so tremendously well for all of the work that they do to serve community. So, so what's happening in engineering and letters and science and the other schools? Do you not get together? Do you not have an opportunity to get together, to get in a room and say, this is just going to be red hat thinking. Let's come up with more creative ways and share the resources and the creative minds with the other uh, schools and uh, programs? One basic thing I want to point out, people in different departments, different schools teach different amount of courses. People in letters and science, humanities and social sciences, we teach a lot. And we are in demand for being in every imaginable committee uh, on campus, uh, system-wide, and all that. So there is no time and energy. So if there were resources, besides the, the lines of hire, that's a whole other different story, which we'll see the result of that as of this year. But the resources to give time release you know, to those professors who can be building this kind of bridges, can be building this kind of, that, you know, grant writing, you know, this organizing. We can't do that. You know, our, our, as chair, I see, you know, my, my, my faculty are completely stressed about their teaching, their demands in service, and, and just they don't have the time and energy. They have all the willingness, and they do it. They overwhelmingly do it. But this is a problem. Again, other schools, uh, the school, of, you know, you know, medical school. I mean, the, the teaching uh, is less. The demand is less. Maybe they put place value on the grant writing and work. Well, it, it is not. So again, we're going back to some structural uh, problems that the administration has to see in order for us to really change. You know, the way that the system is working because the system is not working, <laughs> and we won't be able to advance. You know, uh, this this goal of the HSI excellence and etc. I'd only add one thing to what Soyla said, which is that I think leadership has to be held accountable. I, I've been, I've worked for five different deans in that 17 years, so think about that. The, the leadership changes, and we've been fortunate to have a bunch of people who are really dedicated and try different ways and try to get funding from different sources and are, are from the community, work with the community. I mean, it's the same struggle, but I feel that leaders of departments, of schools, et cetera, uh, you know, need to be held accountable. And I, you know, I guess I'd close with that. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our panelists.